Hello and welcome to Business 7, your weekly program on economic and financial matters in Namibia, but also in Africa. Please stay tuned, we've got a packed program for you and we'll be back right after this. Thank you so much to FMB for this opportunity. much to FNB, what an experience. I never got to do shopping in five minutes, but look at all this. Let's first take a look at the top five business stories that made headlines in Africa over the past week. It's compiled by Reuters. Here's what's been making the business headlines in sub-Saharan Africa this week. Societe Generale has agreed to sell some of its businesses in Africa in an attempt to more effectively allocate capital. France's third biggest listed bank said on Thursday it had signed agreements with Pan-African banking groups Vista and Coris to take over its activities in Congo Republic, Equatorial Guinea, Mauritania and Chad. South Africa's rand regained more than 3% against the dollar this week, recovering steep losses from last month. The country is in the midst of its worst ever power crisis, but some encouraging economic data, including narrowly avoiding recession, has aided the currency's recovery. Zimbabwe's main stock market temporarily halted trading on Wednesday, for the second time in two days, to allow time to cool off. That's after the all-share index rose 10% as Zimbabweans sought to hedge themselves against a weakening currency, down 70% since the start of the year. Namibia has banned the exports of unprocessed lithium and other critical minerals, the government announced on Thursday, as it seeks to profit from growing global demand for metals used in clean energy technologies. The country has significant deposits of lithium as well as rare earth minerals such as dysprosium and terbium, which are needed in the production of electric cars and wind turbines. And finally, the cashew industry in Ivory Coast, the world's leading producer, has been plunged into an unprecedented crisis, farmers, buyers and sector experts have said. Production rose to 1 million metric tons by the end of 2022, creating a stock surplus at the same time as demand tumbled, causing a price slump. The past weekend saw a momentous occasion when the Namibian group Powerline Africa officially handed over a 400 kilo volt power line to NAM power. The value of this asset is more than 600 million Namibian dollars. Take a look. Powerline Africa has handed over 287 kilometers of 400 kilovolt electricity transmission line to NAM power. At a celebration of completion of the project at Farm Success over the weekend, Richard Himmel said it was an honor for Powerline Africa to learn from NAM Power, take that knowledge out of the country, and bring it back to build this power line. Well done, he told employees of the company he has spent his life building up. My inland, Saljele Nitrinjit, this is Wolfgang, and I hammer now, alles, alles what I can do. Powerline Africa is a wholly Namibian-owned company able to provide turnkey solutions and innovation in the power distribution industry in, in the SADC region. At the celebration, NAM Power's senior transmission engineer Martin van der Merwe said the achievement 
will impact the whole country. It has a massive impact on houses in the country. And we'll have a lot of money. It's something related to the numbers. 287 kilometers, 560 hours. Volker Rogmeier, representing the contractors, highlighted that the asset can now be handed over to Nampower, which will be able to electrify the line and connect it to the national grid and start making profit from it within a month. Schwan Erlang, Powerline Africa site manager, spoke of how the massive undertaking gained momentum soon after the signing of the $630 million contract on 16 April 2021. So uh, the beginning, 16 April 2021, contract signage. Total 11 containers, 180 tents and 150 new installations. Marco Himmel said that with opportunity must come responsibility to ensure success. That opportunity without responsibility, without responsibility, results in failure. Francois Kumbi, Powerline Africa CEO, said that over the last two years, Powerline Africa has established 500 kilometers of 400 kilovolt transmission lines, including the Juno to Commerce project finished with ESCOM in South Africa. For me, these principles have allowed us to compete and feature on the international front throughout Africa, forcing us always to be one step ahead through turnkey solutions. And that's a concept that was originally ingrained in us by NAPAL, successfully obtaining ISO certification and maintaining that certification. They say it's easy to get an A+. Plus, but to keep that A plus is even more difficult. Nigeria's got huge fuel problems and it's causing a lot of turmoil in the country. Reuters has filed two reports on this very contentious issue in the country. Welder Shola Ojo starts his day by powering up his generator. But the cost of working on the unfinished metal doors and gates propped up around his roadside workshop in Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos, has almost doubled. That's after new president Bola Tinubu scrapped a fuel subsidy. Ojo is now working at a loss to finish the work he's been paid for and preparing to pass on the costs to new orders. What we buy is what we would sell. A door we do for 80,000 Naira or 75,000 Naira before. Now we can't sell it for less than 130,000 to 150,000. Many in Africa's biggest economy earn a living from small and informal businesses. However, great power is patchy. Businesses and households rely on petrol generators for electricity. For decades, the popular fuel subsidy has kept prices low, but it also drained billions of dollars from state coffers. On Monday, Tinubu said the subsidy's removal was needed to save the country from going under and that the pain felt by citizens would be repaid through massive investment. In the short term, Nigerians like Rejoice Chukuneke are being forced to cope with a sudden surge in their costs. She was excited to launch a new job in marketing at the beginning of May. Now, she says, the fuel price rise means she'll have to resign. If I should continue, it means that at the end of the month, I'll have to borrow money and feed since 80% of my salary goes into transportation. As she sits on the bus, Chukuneke ponders her chances of getting a job closer to home. Unemployment is rife in Nigeria. Much could depend on whether this short-term pain does result in long-term gain. Nigeria's new president, Bola Tinubu, has removed a popular fuel subsidy. 
It's a move that's seen petrol prices nearly triple in a country with high rates of poverty. So what's the reason? The subsidy has kept petrol prices low for decades in Africa's biggest economy. But it's also been an enormous drain on state resources. The cost for the government last year? $10 billion. That's widened budget deficits and driven up debt. Tanubu, who was sworn in in May, made removing the subsidy a top priority of his election campaign. On becoming president, Tanubu has also inherited a grim financial picture. It includes record debt, foreign exchange and fuel shortages, and inflation at a nearly two-decade high. Oil production in the continent's biggest producer has been falling due to theft and underinvestment. Many international investors have pulled out of Nigeria in recent years. And for them, removing the fuel subsidy, as well as foreign exchange market reform and raising taxes, is a priority. But for many Nigerians, the move has increased hardship as prices spiralled. Petrol-powered generators are widely used in homes and businesses. Analysts say farmers will face steeper costs to take produce to markets, leading to higher food prices. The subsidy removal has also angered labour unions, though they have suspended an indefinite strike after talks with the government. They've called for a more than six-fold rise in the monthly minimum wage, among other demands. Economic analysts expect to see the impact of higher petrol costs in the June inflation rate. But Tanubi says the sacrifice is needed for the survival of the country. The government I lead will repay you through massive investment in transportation, infrastructure, education, regular power supply, healthcare, and other public utilities that will improve the quality of life. Those benefits will be yielded. However, the end of the subsidy has been welcomed by ratings agencies Moody's and Fitch. They said Tanubu's willingness to tackle the subsidy and Nigeria's multiple exchange rates was positive for the economy, though Moody's also warned of the risk of a transitional period of higher inflation, weaker economic activity, and more social discontent. Connection. It's in the human touch. The feeling of belonging, it inspires us and empowers us, creates clarity from complexity. It starts new conversations, unlocks the power of advice and makes an impact on your life. At Alex Forbes, we pioneer insight to provide you with advice that connects your decisions of today to your impact tomorrow. Lithium is big, big business in Namibia. In its infant shoes, but set to become a major player in the country's mining activities. We spoke to Simone Storm, economist Theo Klein. Starting his homework on lithium, joining us in the studio is Simone Storm, economist Theo Klein. Welcome once again, Theo. Thanks for having me, Germany. Good to be here. Um, and, uh, International analyst has called uh, the investor rush um, around lithium um, as being the gold rush on steroids. Mm. Why all this attention all of a sudden to lithium? So I think um, we probably have in part the war in Ukraine to thank for that, Germany. Um, but even before that, since 2015, countries across the globe, many are rich countries, embarked on a journey to um, sort of the net zero carbon emissions or the energy transition, where they want to reduce their carbon emissions, become more green, um, to uh, prevent major effects of climate change and so forth. So that process has already started bef since 2015, but I think the war in Ukraine exposed vulnerabilities in Europe, where they realized there is an over-dependency on Russia for energy. Mm -hmm and now they're scrambling for alternatives. Um, coming closer to home, you have uh, corruption running rife at ESCOM and uh, major load shedding issues or electricity supply issues. And so they are also scrambling for some alternative because I think 
many realize that the issues at ESCOM is not going to be resolved anytime soon. At the same time, Germany, as, re as a result of this energy transition, various companies um, that manufacture cars have said they want to stop selling combustion engines, mainly by 2035. So, I mean, that's 12 years away from now, where um, pretty much all the cars then in the rich countries have to be electric vehicles. And to prepare for that, you need to start ramping up production of these electric vehicles be be uh, between now and 2020, uh, 2035. Sorry. So I think all of this is what's creating this demand for lithium and why many analysts globally are saying that this sector is set to boom um, over the next couple of years. I mean, to put it in perspective, in 2021, the lithium, global lithium sector was valued at about 6.8 billion US dollars. And analysts are now saying it will be 400 billion oh. by 2030. So, but I think it's all of, um, and uh, most of this demand is likely for batteries, especially for your electric vehicles. And um, bringing the issue closer to home, um, what is the status of lithium mining and exploration in Namibia? So, uh, what's interesting, Jeremy, is there's two lithium mines who used to be operational before independence the last. So they are now looking to ramp up or resume production after all these years. Um, that's, I only know of two projects that are sort of very close to production stage, which would be in Karabib and in ACE. But then there are a lot of other exploration that we know, that we know of that's taking place in the country. I'm not too sure exactly how much um, or how many exploration licenses have been given out because I'm still waiting for an answer from Mines and Energy. <laughs> but um, take a bit. I understand that there is a lot of exploration taking place for that. So what's interesting is that Namibia is only known to have lithium, lithium deposits in the Damaraland area, and then also all the way in the south by Ausenke and Karab, um, Karasberg. Mm. So I would suspect that most of the exploration is taking place there, especially in Damaraland, uh, where that um, yeah, there used to be Afriton and now Andrada found one of the largest deposits apparently in the world um, there in ACE. So I think a lot of investment is um, currently being spent in Namibia for exploration in lithium, most likely in that area. So I don't know, I only have two projects that, and that I base my estimates on or my positivity for the sector in Namibia. Yes. But I think more and more projects are likely to be announced um, as they do their experiments and drilling. Yes, and uh, for uh, purposes of this program, we'll stay clear from the controversy around um, <laughs> Zinfen. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> we'll uh, leave that in the hands of the Honourable Minister and uh, his people to sort out. <laughs>
And if we look at different influences over the years, you know, we focused on a lot of the things like culture, like um, background, like um, generations even, but we didn't look at the emotions. And with COVID-19 and the highlight around the uh, well-being of our employees, this is also a key element that we need to look at when it comes to the perception of risk and the response to risk. So that links back to the neuroscience where we look at how your emotions and uh, play, play into your decision you take on, on the management of risk. Because people think a lot about it's, it's the historic data that we convert into all these reports, but when the time comes, how you respond, that is what is the key element to the effective management of risk. And I was delighted to see that uh, an influential group like Capricorn um, released this thought le leadership piece by you because um, since COVID-19, it's been an ongoing debate globally, the effect yeah. of the pandemic and um, the consequences and trauma thereof on yeah. um, employees' well-being and how that in the end will impact on, on corporates. Um, a, a healthy employee, I'm not talking about me, so you can't, <laughs> you can't cite me, but what does a healthy, a mentally healthy employee look like? Yeah, I think just maybe to take a quick step back, yes. Capricorn Group started with the Risk Culture Builder Program in 2019 when I came back to Namibia specifically to look at risk culture. And then, as you've mentioned, with COVID, there's more focus on it. I think for the healthy employee, the, the key element, we highlight a few things in the article, mm. but the key one to me is that self-motivation. It's that ownership. I own how I respond to a situation of risk. I own my perception of that. Uh, and I need to be aware of, for example, biases that play into this. And I need to be aware of my emotions. When I get up this morning um, and I'm not in a good mood, I may take the wrong decision uh, with regards to the management of risk in my job. So I need to be aware of those things. So for me, the key element there is that ownership and that self-motivation. Um, there are a few others that we mentioned, but to me, that's the most important thing, that the employee owns it. Um, don't wait for your manager to come and tell you, uh, you know, this is the way you should do it. Uh, own it, know what the shortcomings are, know what your emotions are, and then uh, know that that affects how you respond to that situation of risk. And that doesn't just pertain to the workplace. As we've seen globally, um, it, it is an ongoing movement that of self-awareness yeah. and mindfulness, as they, as they call it, uh, that you should be totally in touch with your emotions so that you can manage them yeah. and detach them sort of from your actions because they can influence uh, your yeah. actions quite drastically. Yeah, they definitely influence your actions and in our focus, how you respond to a situation of risk. Uh, I often, in the, in the training sessions, I often use the the example of, of the married men and the, and the single men in the room, and I asked them if you have a fight with your wife or your girlfriend, do you just quietly close the door, pull away and drive within the speed limit? And normally the woman will burst out <laughs> laughing while the men still think on how to answer this question. So yes. And here we have your, the same scenario. I'm your laughing. emotions plays a role. It does indeed, <laughs> and it has consequences. Every day, you make choices that make you legendary. Journey together with us on the path to securing your legacy as a member of the League of Legends. With the Select Platinum Bundle Fee Premium Bank offering, you will access tools that will enable you to thrive. If you earn $850,000 Namibian dollars per annum or more, you can apply for this offering today via bankventure.com.na for only $447 Namibian dollars per month. Bank Venture a member of Capricorn Group. That's Business 7 for this week. We'll see you again next week. Playing out, we have a video of Reuters showing the unhappiness of Kenyans on a proposed taxes on fuel and housing. Until next time, goodbye.
Kenyan police fired tear gas on Tuesday at hundreds of people protesting in Nairobi. The demonstration was against a proposed finance bill that would hike taxes on fuel and housing. President William Ruto is under pressure to increase revenues in the face of rising government debts. But his proposals have been criticised by civil servants and political opponents, who say the cost of living is already too high. Around 500 protesters marched to Parliament to present a petition against the bill. Eleven protesters were seen being detained by police. Ruto has defended the bill, saying its provisions are needed to ensure financial security. It will create jobs for young people, he claims, by building new homes financed through the housing levy. The opposition as a Mio La Umoja party has been leading protests since March against the high cost of living and alleged fraud in last year's election. It has said the finance bill would take Kenya back to the 1980s when the economy started to deteriorate.